Data Storytellers. Today, I'm here with Ella Osterberger, who is the Vice President of Data at WeTransfer. She has a, a super interesting background, which I'm sure you'll shortly hear a lot about and, and more. Great to have you with us, Ella. Thanks so much. Nice so to just to start with, tell us a little bit about your, your background, your journey to becoming a data leader. Yeah, sure. I guess I've always been a real data nerd, uh, even since I was at school. I would always secretly do all the math books in advance because I really enjoyed it. And then there wasn't such a, such a thing as data science. So I guess I was born pre that term. So I guess I found my own way there. So I uh, my background is more in like economics, statistics, econometrics. That's kind of what I studied. And then was really interested in like um, you know, HTML, I, I started to code a lot. I was really interested in user experience, in product development, and then it all happened that the, the data science field emerged and I was working quite early on in my career in kind of digital transformation projects. So I guess that was that was the beginning to it. Mm. And you've come for a lot of uh, quite diverse, interesting companies, just, just taking a look at your LinkedIn here. You were working mm -hmm. at The Guardian and, and Deliveroo, now heading up uh, WeTransfer. What was kind of the the differences, but also the common themes that you've seen throughout that time? I guess what um, links up my career is that I really enjoy using data to transform a business and all the companies that I joined had to go through quite an interesting phase of their evolution. And so data was really at the core of that. So um, at The Guardian, for example, they realized that the ad revenue for the digital product was kind of going more and more to the bigger companies like the Googles and mm. um, uh, Facebooks of this world and, and less and less uh, could you make money just by running ads on your website. So they were in a situation where they had to reinvent their business model. So uh, I was working very much on that and data was a very core cool part of finding a new revenue source for the company to sustain itself uh, mm. sustainably. And then, um, I guess at, at Deliveroo, very, very different, you know, very fast growing startup when I joined, but also in order to allow for that growth, um, we had to be very smart at making very good decisions. And uh, actually Deliveroo was very data driven from day one. And so that data team grew very, very quickly and became more and more important to the company. Mm. Absolutely. So what are you focusing on now over at uh, WeTransfer? It's a relatively new role, you know, just, just less than a year. Uh, how does that differ again, all the, all the same? Yeah, so I guess just from my personal interest, I was really interested in learning more about the data engineering side, also data governance, um, you know, compliance. So I work a lot with the legal team on establishing, establishing a data council. And as I said, I, I also now um, look after uh, data engineering. So building modern data infrastructure is, of course, also really um, really important part of like really holistically understanding what data can do for company. So I guess that was kind of what attracted me to uh, to the company, but also their values. I was really interested in joining a B Corp. So uh, a company mm. that is very responsible in how they um, how they operate and also, I guess, how they treat customer data. So that was also what attracted me to that role. Mm. And yeah, it's been a crazy journey over the last few months. Really, when I joined, there was a lot to be done. And I feel like we have achieved a lot in the in eight, nine months that I've been there. So mm. uh, it's been fun. You have these, these this quite a diverse background here. So how do you see data analytics today? What do you think about the state of the data function and the general progress of uh, data-driven business transformations in the corporate world? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I, I also, on the side, I, I work with a venture capital firm where I advise startups on how they should set up their data functions from like day one to be data driven. And I think there's a lot of confusion in the market that you need to start with like machine learning, AI from day one to really be ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. But I, I see, you know, from a like very practical point of view, what you need to have is understand what data is valuable for your business, have a good data strategy. And then based on that really, uh, you know, build a data warehouse where you can actually collect the data. And then you need some basic analysis. You need people who really want to understand what drives the business, um, find opportunities for the business. So mm -hmm. it's maybe much more like having very strong analytics 
that is much more important than more advanced you know, machine learning or AI. I would say so. I think that's an interesting observation that there's a lot of hype on like certain very niche roles, but actually the broader data roles are not covered or don't get as much attention at mm. the moment. Yeah, and a phrase that gets thrown around in this arena is 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 data drivenness, right? So yeah. it's okay. How do you actually define data drivenness? Because that probably meant a bunch of different things at uh, all the companies you work for and the current one. Yeah, I think for me. Being data driven, so I guess there are different levels to being data driven. I think the first, as I said um, already when I discussed the different roles, is to really get the basics right and make sure that you as a company make good decisions based on the data that you have. And that actually is already quite an achievement, I would say. It's already quite difficult to have data in such a format and using it in such an ingrained way in your company that you make the right decisions. And then I think the second step to being data driven is to really exploit all the data to its maximum to really make sure that you um, you know find opportunities where the data leads you and then the last one is really to disrupt to think what can this data now do for us mm -hmm. that might really change actually what we do as a business so i think there's like you know baby steps to that but at least uh, for me data driven absolutely has to mean that we make decisions based on the data rather than purely based on gut feel, right? Mm. And, and where do you think the greatest opportunities for ambitious companies and leaders are today? Oh, I think, well, opportunities. Yeah, maybe opportunity, maybe challenge. I think it's um, the way we access data, I guess I'm, I'm thinking especially product analytics is changing, right? the consent that we get to treat, um, kind of to work with third party data is changing. So I think more and more we'll have to be transparent with our customers on how we use the data and how it serves them. So I feel like in the past, we've really relied on third party data where you, you know, maybe you're able to collect some data on the customer quite easily. But now I think we're moving to a phase where we need to be much more transparent when we mm. say, if we want to know this about you, well, I'll ask you. I'm not going to ask a third party to tell me, you know, what you're interested in. But if that's what, what's important to us as a business, we should be much more transparent with you. So I think there's this move from like third party data to um, first, to first party data. And I think that's quite an interesting challenge slash opportunity. Yeah, super interesting because a lot of what you've said so far is has touched on responsibility and, uh, and yeah. with data, right? So the, you see like a big influx over the last few years of the, the CDO, CDAO roles. So with that in mind then, what are the actual roles that those individuals play in organizations? Yeah, that's interesting. So um maybe going back to what you just said on like responsible use of data. So I think that right now I'm working on like a data council um, that I'm uh, building together with the legal team, because I think uh, often companies think, oh, is that legally allowed? Can we do this legally? And then you get, you know, they get a yes or no from the legal team. And then they might come to my team and they say, hey, is this technically possible? Can we collect that data? And I say yes or no. But that doesn't necessarily mean as a company we should do that, right? So I think establishing clear guidelines of what as a company we stand for, like every company has like their values of how they treat their employees and how, how they want the company to be seen. I think we also should have a set of values when it comes to how we use data responsibly. Um, sorry, that hasn't answered the question, what should a CDO do? <laughs> I can come to that now if you want. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's all good color to, to go into it with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. So I guess um, what is really important, and I've seen that in this role now, you really need to have a strategy. I think without a proper data strategy, it's very hard for any team to, to know what they're working towards. So I think having a very high level vision of uh, understanding what needs to be done in the company and what the opportunities are is really important. But then also, of course, implementing on that. So having a very clear and tactical path and like, if we want to achieve that, these are the next steps of how we can actually do that. Um, and then I guess also super important is generating this, like, as you said, data-driven culture. 
And that doesn't end within the data team. That really needs to be an effort that spans across the company. And then, of course, identifying business opportunities um, that data can bring, as I said earlier, like, you know, how far can you drive it with your data strategy or kind of with how data driven the big company really should be. And um, yeah, of course, you know, kind of eventualizing uh, the, the, the data, but not just the data, but also like what the company does and be mm. kind of an, an ambassador. And I think you, you touched on the, the key challenge there, which is both the, the culture change and also the evangelism. So yeah. from your experience, what are some of the best ways for data analytics leaders to maybe not become evangelists because that's a huge ask, but maybe to gain more influence within the business? Yeah, so I think there may be, there may be a few elements to how you can persuade people. So um, I think it's it's more when you join a company, I feel like, you get a new opportunity to do this every time. So I, mm. I, I feel like I've kind of recent, uh, recently gone through this. So I think there's one, one level, which is just establishing real trust from one person to the other and getting to know the people. And I think there it really just matters to spend time with each other, to really see what their worries are, what their ambitions are, to understand them as like a fellow human and, you know, to, to make sure that you can, you can uh, have that trusted relationship. And then the other thing is you need to really understand how the communication works between you. And so, for example, um, you know, that that's something we still iterate on, but how do we communicate to uh, the board? How do we communicate to uh, different members of the exec team? How do we communicate to uh, engineering managers and to product leaders? So I think having like the right communication channels uh, to keep everyone involved and updated is really important. Um, but then also how you get things done, I think is quite interesting. So there, there's a difference with how you communicate and then how you actually move things ahead. So I think there's also there's also different styles that are required based on who you work with. So in general, there's like, I think there's some uh, concept of change management from uh, Kurt uh, Lewin, I think he's called, but basically he says, rather than um, in order to motivate people, rather than kind of put pressure on them, what you should do is remove obstacles. So that's always my first go-to. I really want to mm. make sure that I understand why is it currently not happening the way it should? And how, what can I do to remove obstacles so that we all have the same common goal, right? Rather than putting pressure on people. It doesn't mm. always work, right? So right now I'm in a phase where I need to establish that. I need to establish these good processes that lead to a good outcome. And in the meanwhile, while you build up those, you know, the removing obstacles, you sometimes need to apply pressure too. But I think finding a good way there is important. Mm. And then the last point on like working effectively together is around recognizing other people's strengths and your own and maybe your own weaknesses as well. And so I think you can really create like, um, you know, a team of kind of superheroes, you know, like Marvel comic, um, if you understand what everyone does really well. And I see that now in our product leadership team, you know, we have different skills so there's one person that's super commercial someone who is very detailed like focused who can really drive the outcome um, we have someone who thinks really big and you know so there are different people with different strengths and I feel like if you if you um, combine it in a smart way you can get so much done so I think that's also part of like making sure you work well together that you really see what what other people can add and you underlined and I mentioned both trust and communication there, which is just a perfect mm -hmm. segue into my, my next bunch of topics here, because uh, you mentioned that you, you need to be able to build that trust. You also alluded to some of the, the best questions and the best ways to approach this. So uh, can you just elaborate on what you think are some of the your, your you know, your approach of, of uh, and your process of reaching out to those key stakeholders, whether they're on your team or on the board or in between mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and establishing those fruitful relationships? Yeah, so I think when it comes to, I always feel like trust and communication are very much linked. So I think, you know, making sure that I communicate with them what I feel like needs to be done in terms of data strategy, really understanding what they need from my team 
and then really making sure that we have a very concrete plan of how we can achieve that together. And it's not, it's never one way. It's always like, this is how we get there together. And nearly like forming like a, maybe contract is too strong of a word, but like a plan of how we can make it work. Mm. And then I think to establish trust, you need to make sure that you, you do your part, what you've agreed to, you stick to that. And if you don't, because things happen all the time, you need to communicate really well of why this is happening or what's not working right now. So I feel like if they know they can trust me to help them with their problems, um, and if there's any delays I'll communicate, then they will do the same uh, same back. So I really think it's about like managing expectations, communicating frequently, and understanding their needs and how our needs fit together to progress the company. Yeah, you're almost talking about basic empathy, that like professional empathy, <laughs> yeah, which exactly. I really like. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's a really good way no, to characterize I it, I think. Yeah. I think it really comes down to just being like a decent human being and, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> and working together collaboratively. And yeah, empathy certainly plays a plays a big role. Yeah, and, and again, just tying this in the framework of both trust and the, the goal, which is the culture change piece, mm -hmm. what, are, what do you think are the qualities of the leaders who inspire that real change and who are, who are actually successful at driving these transformations? Yeah, God, I, I have a long list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think um, for like good qualities of like a, a leader that can really encourage change is, first of all, I think you need to be really passionate about the consumer right like in the end everything you do has a certain outcome and you need to really believe in that and you re really need to care I think that's really important you need to be very dedicated but also you need to be someone who is never happy with the current state but is striving for like what can we do better right and what are we doing tomorrow to make it even better um, I think as a data leader especially I think you need to have some credibility with the team uh, you need to speak the same language. You need to really understand different aspects of like the, the data uh, areas. You know, like I, I was saying, you know, we need to be able to talk to data engineers. You need to be able to talk to the machine learning people. You need to be able to speak to the board. You know, you need to really um, be able to be credible with, with uh, different areas of the business. Um, and then the other thing I think is really important for any leader or managers to really uh, build a strong team, um, defend the team, motivate the team. So really be like a, a proper cheerleader to the team that you've built and grow that team very strongly. Um, I guess the other thing that's kind of linked to that is being very open-minded, very compassionate, very considerate, inviting inviting conversations, inviting a challenge, right? And, and also being mm. very transparent back to people. And yeah, then the point you've made, you know, it's all about also relationship building and communication as well. Sorry, a long list. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a long list. It's hard to find someone who takes all of these, but yeah. Absolutely. And and this is where the, 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 we separate the wheat from the chaff in those data leaders. The data leaders who can do all of the things you said are the ones who are going to, as I said, inspire that real change as well. So mm -hmm. what role did these skills play in your success as a as a professional during your career? You know, for example, securing sponsorship from the execs, spreading data literacy throughout the business or changing the perspective of key stakeholders. Can you give some examples? Yes. Um, so maybe I can talk a bit about, like, I think one thing that I've done a lot in the companies I've worked with for is really create a data culture beyond the data team. So at, um, at each of my roles, actually, I've always been someone who really enjoys teaching uh, and really sharing what my team has discovered with a wide audience to make sure that, you know, it really gets, first of all, it's good for the team because they can celebrate their work and it's seen, but also it's good for everyone in the company. So that's one thing I really do is I, I run a lot of training courses for all levels of like data, current level of, you know, data, data scores, I guess. Um, so that's one thing. And then, sorry, what were what, what the other examples you asked uh, like me data, about? Uh, spreading data literacy and uh, yeah. doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, in terms of data literacy, I guess, yeah, it's a lot around like um, championing what we are doing, inviting everyone to join the conversation. Because as I said, it's, it's not just the data team that has to carry a data data-driven company, but really 
everyone in the business needs to feel like they they are responsible for like data quality as well and raise things if they don't look right or ask us to help them make better decisions with data so that the appetite needs to be there too. And so I've worked probably in both companies. One was more like, I call them push and pull when it comes to data culture. So at The Guardian, people would like bite my head off to get data, right? They were so eager. It was very mm -hmm. much like they pulled it like from us. And then at The Guardian, um, uh, it was more like, you know, pushing it on people a bit, especially the editorial flow. They weren't as bought in initially. So it's like, look at this. Did you know mm -hmm. that? Did you, you know? And so we run a lot of really fun workshops where we did some quizzes and, you know, it, it was very lightweight uh, uh, approach to educating people. They didn't feel like very lectury, but more like fun and engaging. And then we also would show them these interesting pieces of maybe unexpected information to get them excited. And then they come back for more. So I think mm. that's, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah, even just building the the trust that way, it's 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 a much longer process to build than it is to lose that trust, right? Um, that's Absolutely. that's a really key element of this. So you have to be not not really treading on eggshells, but you really have to be careful about the way that you approach and what, being careful not to overpromise and underdeliver, which I think is key. And actually, totally. I just want to I just want to tie something uh, back into what you said earlier about uh, the qualities of the data leader. So you mentioned, or you alluded to at least, the uh, how you have to be assertive in some cases or, or courageous but also you know empathetic and, and humble so uh, do they need to be at odds with each other do you think no I don't think so I think um oh I have a quote there that I, I <laughs> I'll share later but I think it's something like there are certain roles that you play where sometimes you have to be incredibly emp empath empathetic mm. in other ways you have to really listen uh, carefully to what your team is saying really engaging being very you know you have to be very uh, vulnerable and approachable and I think uh, authentic and um, and I think only that allows you to be very confident in the decisions that you make because it's not me coming in and overriding everyone else it's me feeling like I'm a sponge I'm listening to everyone I, I, I want to be challenged. I want my thoughts to be, you know, put on the question. And equally, I want to do that with other people. So there, there needs to be this environment of, of transparency, trust, where feedback is welcome. And so I think for that to happen, you as a leader have to be super, like, uh, vulnerable, right? But then once I have allowed this process to happen, I can make very informed and confident decisions and I think that's when what is really important for the team that you then say right I've listened to you this is what we're gonna do and I want everyone mm. to support me in this journey and uh, with the element that I mentioned earlier with the credibility that really allows you even for the people that might not be on board with you they know that you've gone through the process of listening to other voices too and that even if their voice isn't the one that's you know that's the, the final outcome they will stand behind you and support you on that journey too mm. uh, amazing so uh, look you you've worn a bunch of different hats i would say uh, throughout your career so do you see yourself as a, a key agent of change across the business or or, or what does it mean for you to be a, a data champion and, and a data evangelist yeah i have worn a few different hats over the, over the time right i think in the end um it's all about making the business better than where you find it. And I really mm. think that even now, I, my job is so different to my last job and so different to the job before. But I think, um, you know, you need to kind of be very flexible in understanding how, can you, how you can have the biggest impact for the company to achieve the goals that, that the company has, right? Um, I my sons I don't know if, if that's a thing in the UK but they watch this I think it's a French comic show called Baba Baba, Baba, Baba Bas, but basically there is there's uh, comics and they can shift forms and they can you know turn into both and they can be a tree and they can be a giraffe mm -hmm. and anyway I feel like sometimes it's like that so <laughs> I think in order to be a good um, data leader and you know it means data is so broad it's it runs like blood through a company, it could mean anything. You need to be able to really flex what you do. 
um, because right now I feel like I'm focused a lot on processes. So, so how can different functions work together better? How can we create like uh, objectives and key results for the company? How can, um, you know, how, how can we um, prioritize together what we want to do? What are objectives as a company? It's very broad mm -hmm. because data is also around like setting the direction, right? And so in other ways, it can be very technical. So I think as a, as a data leader, what you need to be able to do is kind of adjust your role depending what is what is needed at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, and you also uh, touched on something there about how you go about approaching the organization when you're wearing these different hats. So how, how do you actually go about, um, you know, looking at educating people on data in the business, whichever one it is? Yeah, so... Um, you know, as I said, there are different, there's so many different stakeholders because data touches every part of the company from like HR to finance to products mm -hmm. to, you know, marketing, everyone wants data. So finding a way to communicate it effectively and also provide people with the skills that they need to kind of help themselves and explore more by themselves. So I think sometimes you just need to ignite some kind of will fire and then it just will will mm. take off by itself so um at the moment i'm running a few workshops one is around experimentation one is around like you know turning everyone into an analyst themselves so i help them uh dig through data tell a story with the data that they explore and so really giving people the skills to become analysts themselves really and so they're less dependent on the data team and really think in a new way of like, I have this idea, I use data to back this up and uh, give me some reassurance if I'm doing the right thing here. So yeah, I think just like nudging people to become more and more, you know, <laughs> becoming kind of hobby analysts. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also you mentioned that earlier you have this this uh, process for this, which obviously you have technology, Everyone, everyone's good with technology. We've talked a lot about people. I would just want to touch on the process. So how intentional and rigorous are you with when you go into an organization or when you have a, a project or an idea that you want to execute? The, the how in, in terms of building a strategic plan, following a roadmap, setting those clear priorities as a leader, do you have a system in place that kind of helps you and the team with this accurate and prompt execution? So, I mean, you know, we have like ways of working, like you can have agile or, or whatever. I think, Right now, I think for me, I'm not so much in the details of like, oh, this wrong request came in. How do we track that? I kind of leave that up to the team to decide how they want to, their best ways of working within the team. I think in my role, it's really important to connect with those like very senior stakeholders and not just hear what's on their roadmap or what they're going to do in Q1, but I want to know where do you want to be in a year from mm. now? Where do you want to be in five years from now? What are your like big ambitions for that team? And then I use that information to translate that into what my team should be doing and achieving in the next year. Because I think, um, especially now that my focus is also more on, on data engineering at the moment, no one understands data engineering that is not in data engineering, right? They don't know what they need until they need it. And then everything's in panic and everyone's mm -hmm. anxious that it hasn't happened and we didn't know it was coming. So I think it's more about understanding where people want to get to with their team, with their area in the future and what we can do to prepare for that. Um, so yeah, I think just for me, it's more like the long-term planning and aligning all the... Um, all the like big ambitions to achieve that mm -hmm. rather than like the day-to-day -day operation so much so for that I do trust people that know that much better so I've uh, I'm, I've hired a, a technical program manager for my team and they are much better suited to actually help them with like the the processes that that we have day in day out yeah Mm. Well, well, Ella, we, we've had a lot of insights from you today. So thanks for coming on the show. Uh, what made you really fall in love with, with data analytics? What do you like most about your, you know, working in this space? Oh, I think one thing I really like is that you can work in so many different industries. As you said, I've, 
I've done a lot of things in my career already. And it's because data allows you to really move from like maybe a very well-established business to a startup, from like um, a delivery company to like a media publisher to like, you know, so many different um, uh, learning experiences. Uh, and you can bring the skills that you have as a data analyst and apply them in so many different environments while still developing and growing and learning about the businesses that you're in. So I think that's probably that's probably mm. it. Last question. What advice would you give for uh, aspiring leaders in data? I think um, focusing really on your strengths. I think I've... Uh, done a very good job at always beating myself up about the things I'm not good at mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like why why aren't I a better uh, machine learning engineer why can't I write Scala why can't I do this why can't you know I was very much like focusing on the aspects that I wasn't good at but then I think sometimes people from the outside reflect on you and they're like you could be a good manager you could do this well and you're like oh yeah maybe I should think about the things that I I am naturally good at and maybe I should just you know, really think about jobs that allow me to focus on the on the things I'm good at. And now I can build a team around me <laughs> of people that are really good at the things that I'm not so good at. So I think just uh, um, follow your passion and do the things that really make you happy. And usually that's focusing on the things you're naturally good at. Um, and then you learn things about the things you're not so good at along the way. Mm. Well, Ella, again, uh, fantastic insights from you today. Uh, thanks for coming on the show and look forward to connecting again soon. Great. Thank you so much for having me.